Hello, everyone. My name is Peter Thompson, and I'm joined by Aaron Mann, one of the other collaborators on this project. Kevin Pateroki also made significant contributions to this project. Aaron is currently working as a water and wastewater EIT at Jacobs, while Kevin and I are both rising senior engineering students. Kevin is studying chemical engineering with an environmental focus, and I'm studying civil and environmental engineering also with an environmental focus. We are proud to represent Case Western Reserve University, as well as the state of Ohio, in presenting to you No Waste, Problem Aced, optimizing beneficial reuse of biosolids prior to BNR upgrades. We will begin our presentation by reiterating the need statement given to us by the wastewater plant operators. We will then describe the plant characteristics. Our alternative evaluation will then be detailed, after which we will present our schematic design of the biosolids treatment and compost facility. We will then summarize our proposal. The need statement provided for this design problem was to provide a method for disposing the biosolids produced by Summit County, Ohio wastewater treatment plant number 36 after it is renovated for biological nutrient removal. The solution needs to include assessment of different alternatives for handling the biosolids and a schematic design of the chosen solution. The current design of the plant um, as of uh, the summer is a rotating biological uh, contact uh, plant. As you can see in this building uh, diagram, there is influence station, which uh, goes through pri primary clarifiers, which drain to the digester building. Um, then the liquid flow through here goes to the RBC building, which then the goes to chemical clarifiers and the sludge from those clarifiers goes to the digesters. So there are two solid streams of sludge going to the digesters. The current design is for four million gallons per day with a peak hydraulic capacity of 10 million gallons per day. The actual sludge that is produced in 2019 was 220,000 gallons per day and it was actually producing 7.5 wet tons of biosolids every day being hauled to the landfill. The upgrade is a biological nutrient removal facility with two different configurations. It was also upgraded to a 5 million gallon um, per day design because of population projections, which we were able to confirm uh, five years after the initial population projection was made. Um, so as we can see with this overlay, the RBC building and these four different clarifiers are gonna be partially demolished and reclaimed um, and are gonna be out of service. Uh, and then uh, in this right, in this open field, there is the uh, building of the biological nutrient removal facility that will produce activated sludge. Expecting that 120,000 gallons per day of the sludge will need to be wasted to the digesters, which will go through this um, sludge pump station. And from that, we expect with the current system, there will be seven wet tons of biosolids produced every day. Uh, the existing solid treatment after the upgrades will have an influent of waste activated sludge based off of the 5 million gallon per day design flow. And like the old system, the upgraded facility will only produce waste activated sludge and no primary sludge. Due to this change, models of the plant predicts the total solids concentration will be reduced by a factor of four, to only 0.3% total solids. The sludge is stabilized then in aerobic digesters, three duty, one standby, which degrade volatile solids. With the upgraded facility flow, the sludge retention time will range from only six to 12 days. Blowers are operated at a constant rate to provide sufficient air to mix the entire volume of the digesters, and provide oxygen for the microbes who degrade the volatile solids. The solids are typically pumped for dewatering twice per week, and they are processed by a single belt filter press, and the finished biosolids have a solids concentration of 20%, which is very consistent with this belt filter press that they have, and all of them are hauled to be landfilled. So one of the alternatives for rearranging this biosolids uh, process would be transforming it into a biogas or energy recovery um, facility. Uh, this facility would have to be very large, 6.2 million gallon reactor volume. Uh, it uses an anaerobic digester to produce methane, converting the energy in the volatile solids and the sludge into 
usable biogas um, or methane. This large facility would produce biogas, which can either be sold at market prices or can be used by generators on site to offset electricity costs for the plant. We examined two Ohio-based compost companies, Comtil and Rust Belt Riders. Comtil is based in Columbus, Ohio, and uses anaerobic digestion to stabilize the biosolids prior to composting. They compost using the aerated static pile method and are able to generate steady revenue from their product. Rust Belt Riders, based in Northeast Ohio, deals primarily with food waste. Much like Comtil, Rust Belt Riders uses the aerated static pile method and sells their compost for profit. Next, our team conducted a 20 year present worth analysis with a 2% inflation rate. This analysis generated a class five estimate. We defined landfilling as the do nothing approach, uh, which has the highest hauling cost. Biogas operators generate high revenue, but also have the highest operating cost. Oh, shoot. Next, our team conducted a 20 year present worth analysis with a 2% inflation rate. This analysis generated a class five estimate. We defined landfilling as the do nothing approach, which has the highest hauling cost. Biogas operations generate high revenue, but also have the highest operating cost. Composting with the lowest net present cost at 20 years was the most economically favorable method. We con uh, constructed a decision matrix to evaluate alternatives based upon cost, effectiveness, reliability, and environmental and community impact. With cost, we seek out low capital investments and high revenue. Effectiveness refers to the amount of biosolids going into the intended treatment method rather than to the landfill. A reliable method is one with low seasonal probability of failure and high safety and ease of operation. Lastly, with environmental and community impact, we look for methods that have low net carbon footprints and low order production, et cetera. As you can see from our decision matrix, we have evaluated five other methods. These methods were quickly eliminated as they were much less feasible than composting and biogas production. Alongside the economic concerns, the main deciding factors between composting and biogas production were the ease of operation and applicability to an operation to the scale of the wastewater plant. For larger operations, biogas would likely be preferred. However, due to the complex, op complex operation requirements, biogas fell short to composting. We have chosen the aerated static pile composting method. This method involves the placement of a mixture of organic matter and bulking agent onto a system of perforated pipes, which forcefully aerates the, con the concoction. Aeration is key for composting, as the process relies on microorganisms breaking down the organic matter while consuming BOD. We also considered the windrow method of composting. This method, similarly to the aerated static pile method, requires the compost to be placed in long piles, known as windrows. However, aeration occurs through mechanical turning rather than forcefully through pipes. Aerated static pile was preferred due to the reduced operation requirement, as well as the superior temperature controls, especially in the state of Ohio, which experiences all four seasons. This diagram shows a cross-sectional view of our aerated, sta aerated static pile design. It consists of two uh, perforated PVC pipes which force air through the wood chip base and up through the mix. A specially designed tarp covers the top of the pile in order to, prov to provide optimal conditions for composting. Leachate is drained out through the channel at the bottom between the two PVC pipes. On the left, you can see a bird's eye view of two aerated static piles. One blower is connected to a manifold which supplies sufficient oxygen to each pile. The airflow can be modified in order to control the temperature as will be discussed in more detail shortly. Six evenly spaced thermometers are placed among the sides of the pile at varying depths and angles in order to ensure that the temperature is an accurate representation of the pile as a whole. Now we will break down the appropriate operations for the facility. We have sized our piles to accommodate up to a full day's worth of biosolid production as well as double that volume in wood chips as bulking agents. So the pile begins with a wood chip layer being evenly distributed over the perforated PVC pipes. An even mix of biosolids and wood chips are then added to the Rotomix truck with the front end loaders and stirred until uniform. The Rotomix truck then uses its belt feature to evenly distribute the mix onto the wood chip base. Once the pile is complete, it is covered by the specialized tarp. The temperature is recorded regularly and this information is used to properly adjust the airflow. 
For optimal microbial growth, the temperature should stay between 140 and 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Airflow and temperature are directly related, so the airflow is adjusted in order to maintain the desired temperature range. After four weeks of minimal maintenance, the tarp is removed from the pile. An operator then uses the compost turner to evenly mix the compost, increasing uniformity. The tarp then goes back over the compost pile. After four more weeks, the tarp is removed and aeration is halted for a final four weeks of curing. The curing process is very important because it ensures that all the pathogens and unsafe public health risks are taken out from the final products. After curing, samples are taken and analyzed from the pile in a laboratory setting to ensure that all the compost is ready for public use and safe. The compost is then taken to the screener where wood chips are removed and recycled for later use. The compost is then taken to the storage facility until it is, until it is purchased. On the left, you can see a blank satellite image of the facility. On the right, you can see where we've decided to locate our compost facility. Here, you can see a partially developed site that is fitted with pavers from a previous unfinished project that was abandoned. And basically this site is ready to be paved upon with concrete with minimal preparation. Other key features on this map, obviously, are here's the old plant layout, and here's a stream that we will need to avoid because the compost leachate uh, produced, obviously if it gets into a stream, it's very uh, harmful to the public and to nature in general. So on the right, you can see where our compost facility will be located, as I previously stated. With minimal additional um, site clearing, we've been able to fit all necessary piles, a storage facility, and a couple of access roads. Here, you have a closer view of the compost facility layout. Along with locating it on top of the, pre uh, the pre developed land as much as possible, we've taken several design considerations into account. For example, the compost storage building is located both as far away from the stream as possible and as close to where the biosolids will be produced in order to minimize the distance traveled by the Rotomix truck and the front end loader. Here you can see that there is a nice large area where this red, uh, this is the compost screening truck. And as you can see, there's a large area for screening located right next to the compost uh, storage building in order to minimize that distance traveled as well. Additionally, we have included two access roads that will connect to the compost or to the uh, wastewater facility. Excuse me. Additionally, we have tried to make these lines in between the comp or, yeah the compost piles as straight as possible in order to minimize the maneuverability required by the operators when driving the large machinery. To ensure that the compost facility is going to be successful, we also evaluated the biosolids pretreatment process, particularly the aerobic digesters to ensure that the solids produced are appropriate for composting and safe for handling. On the left is a table of parameters that control the digester operations. There's a range of temperatures based off of seasons, range of flows with a peak of 120,000 gallons per day for a design, and also a range of total solids loading. We also assumed a volatile solids fraction of 80%, which is typical for most waste activated sludge and is also consistent with what was being produced at the facility before BNR upgrades. On the right is our objectives for the final biosolids product. We need to reduce volatile solids by at least 38% so for odor control. We also need to thicken it to 20% total solids. Finally, we are also concerned about the fecal coliform formation, making sure that it is up to grade with class A biosolids. When we looked at the current facilities, while the aeration is adequate in the digesters for mixing, and the belt press is adequate for thickening to 20% total solids, the volatile solids will not be reduced enough in the low 6 to 12 day sludge retention time. Instead, we are going to need at least a 19 day sludge retention time to provide for sufficient volatile solids reduction. To do this, instead of adding more volume to the digesters, we're proposing thickening the waste activated sludge to reduce flows. So we considered um, three major categories of options for thickening. Um, these options would be implemented, uh, whichever one is chosen, as a pilot study at first because it is very challenging for us to have an accurate characterization of what the sludge will look like and how it will settle. Um, so 
the options include polymer assisted methods, generally unfavored because they have complex operations uh, and we're already adding significant operations with the compost facility. And also the operators at um, the number 36 treatment plant uh, do not want to add a new chemical feed. Membrane thickeners are another option. However, they are very costly um, and are not favored because the actual capital cost would make the um, compost facility no longer cost-effective a solution because of such a high cost. Now, because another option would be to do use gravity thickening, and this is definitely the most effective, cost-effective option, and especially because there are already available chemical thickeners on site. So in order to implement this method, there we would just require aeration to prevent septic conditions and retrofit the some of the current uh, basins to um, to operate with the sludge. This diagram summarizes the new biosolids pretreatment we are proposing. Anything in red is an addition or revision. The waste activated sludge, instead of being pumped directly to the digesters, first goes through the gravity thickener that we are proposing. Uh, with the ones provided on site with the 85 foot diameter, only one is required to be on duty and the other can be standby in the event of a cleaning. Uh, expect a range of two to 3% total solids to come out of these thickeners, which is gonna be sufficient reduction in volume. Your aerobic digesters, because of this uh, reduction in volume, only have to be operated at half capacity. So only two aerobic digesters will be on duty with two on standby. There's still um, the aeration. However, we're also recommending a lower uh, minimum when there are only two digesters in operation to save on operations and electricity costs. Because of the reduced flow, the sludge retention time is greatly increased and in meeting the what is needed to reduce volatile solids, meeting our minimum of 19 day SRT with a minimum 24 day sludge retention time. These solids will come out a consistent total solids of 2% and will still be operated twice per week. On any given day, when they do the operation, we're expecting them to produce 500 to 1,000 cubic feet per operation. And all of that, instead of being landfilled, will now be composted on site at 20% total solids. On the site layout, what this looks, this renovation to the biosolids pretreatment looks like is retrofitting the um, previous chemical thickeners, uh, adding, reinstalling their drives, uh, renovating the sludge pump station number one, uh, which would not be in use in the upgraded facility. Um, and there would be pumping from sludge pushing, slum, sludge pump station number three to the thickeners and then from the thickeners to the digesters. And that is the major renovation to the biosolids pretreatment to accommodate for the compost facility. So the next phase of design for our sort of two components, the compost facility and then the upgrades to biosolids pretreatment, will need to undergo a 30% design, which will produce a set of specifications and drawings uh, for the client to uh, begin uh, working with. It would also produce, the next phase would also produce a class three cost estimate to ensure that the client uh, is getting the payback period that they desire um, and see if there are any adjustments that can be made to adjust the economic cost. Also, as one of the next phase, they could start looking at partnerships with either um, restaurants or, um, or farms. So they could either increase the quality of their products by adding in co-digestion with food waste, or they could even ensure there's a end market for the compost by um, working with landscaping facilities and farms. Thank you for listening to our presentation. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to learn during this time. Uh, we also are very grateful to all the advisors, including the superintendent of the plant, Kristen Woods, our academic advisor, Dr. Rhodes, and the Ohio Water Environmental Association leads, particularly Krishna, who was our main uh, correspondent throughout the design. 
Thank you. We look forward to hearing feedback.